So welcome back, everyone. Um, very excited to have our keynote presenter today. He's well known in the industry, Colin Bootsfeld. I hope I've pronounced it okay. Um, is an expert in refrigeration and refrigerants. He's a chemical engineer. Um, as well as having practice cooling as an, as an engineer in terms of multiple applications over the last 20 years. So he, he, he knows our industry back to front. And back in 2010, he joined Colwright in Belgium as a project engineer and has really kind of built up the team. He's had a big picture perspective and not just looking at refrigeration, but a variety of different aspects of the business to try and make the, that business more sustainable. Introducing hydrogen technology and electrifying heavy transport. So really thinking big, big picture and carbon impact and footprint. And then since 2013, he's been responsible for introducing natural refrigerants within the business. And more recently, um, looking at heat pumps and comfort cooling with propane. Um, why we invited Colin to uh, present today as an end user, as a keynote end user presenter today, really was to um, hear his perspective as an end user. Because as I said, he's, he's a chemical engineer by training. And he's looked at all the refrigerants, natural and non-natural, and, and has found some interesting insights that we're going to learn about today. So I'd like to welcome Colin on stage, on the virtual stage. Um, and then uh, over to you, Colin. Thank you very much, Mark, for introducing me like that. I will share my screen. There we are. OK. Oh, that's just, yeah, that's good. Well, good uh, morning, everyone. And thank you, Mark, for introducing me. And indeed, I'm a chemical engineer, and I would like to share with you some insights from an end user perspective on refrigerant. But before I start with the technicality of the matter, I would like to share with you who is Colgate Group and why did we even bother to look into this so deeply? Here's the title of my presentation. But who is the end user? You see, the end user for Colgate Group is the lady shopping in our supermarkets. Or maybe we should talk about her child that is eating our products that we sell. So that is the end user in our perspective. Yet Colgate Group, of course, as a company, is an end user of refrigeration equipment and also of refrigerants. So we are the end user in the refrigeration industry. You can see, by the way, that this lady is inside the famous cold room. This is a very special way of cooling and is very efficient, much more efficient than refrigerated cabinets, which we also use for from time to time. But Cold Group is more than that. Cold Group is also a wholesaler. And actually, this is the core of the business. The core of Cold Group is a wholesaler. This is how we started. And if you go to the supermarkets in Belgium today, the Cold supermarkets, you will see that they kind of look like a distribution center. This is because that the racks that are in those shops come originally from the distribution center. So they are much, more, much heavier, much larger than you would expect normally in a supermarket. But we are, we are also a wholesaler for independent supermarkets. Further on the line, Colgate Group is also a distributor and a producer of energy. What you see here in the picture is a hydrogen filling station. This is close to our headquarter in Halle. And at this location, as you can see actually the pictures on the white box there, on this location, we have wind turbines, solar panels on the roof, and a production facility that transforms that electricity into hydrogen. And that very hydrogen you can use here to fill up a car. So Colgate Group has a, a number of uh, passenger cars uh, already on hydrogen, also testing uh, uh, trucks with hydrogen. So this way we can balance the grid and we can actually absorb electricity that's being produced at times where we cannot use it so well, and then we can make hydrogen out of it. But also Colgate Group produces its own electricity 
in the North Sea wind turbines on land on all the roofs of on the roofs of our supermarkets, and we also sell that publicly. So we are a distributor and a producer of energy, and of course we do this because we want to be any cost efficient. Last, and I'll just put this away here. Make it easier for you. So Last Colorado Group is also a registered registered refrigeration company. We are actually registered, and we have registered technicians who know and are officially qualified to work with chemical refrigerants. And you see here some of my colleagues, engineers and technicians starting a new cooling plant. And that's very important because that's, we are not only bringing here the perspectives of the end user, we are at the same time, Colorado Group is also a refrigeration company. Let us look at some possible evaluation criteria for refrigerants. I grouped them in three categories. The first five relate to somehow environment or energy. It's, the, it's, it's an environmental concern. I'm sure you are aware of these uh, criteria. Then we have two in red, which concern safety. So by changing from one refrigerant to the other, we may run into some safety uh, aspects. And the last two at the bottom are the bottom line, they are the investment costs and the running costs. And of course, we also need to look at them at those as well. Now, if we look at criteria, we need to evaluate the risk that we have in, with respect to these different criteria. Risk is defined by impact times probability. And I want to look a little bit closer into the probability. On the right-hand side, I have taken a picture from the book, Skin in the Game from Nicolas Taleb. Of course, you would need to read the entire book to get the full picture, because he speaks about how only a few people in our world make decisions, but these people who make the decisions do not necessarily, they are not necessarily impacted by what they do or what they decide because they are in the elite. That allows them to make a mistake in probability calculations. At the top, we have what's called the ensemble probability. So if I take a group of people, say I drove to work this morning, I drove in my car, it was a busy road. If I run into an accident, that's bad luck for me, but that does not really affect the other drivers. If I look at time probability, if I go to work every day, at some point in time, eventually I might have an accident. And at that moment, I'm ruined. You know, I could die, I could have a serious injury. So in the same probability in time is not is different than the same probability over a group of people. Sorry, I have to wait for the announcement here. I cannot stop that. Let us look at the total equivalent warming impact. Well, this is live, you know, uh, so I can't stop this. It's somebody's great. It's great. It's great. Don't somebody's worry. badly parked here, <laughs> and I cannot some, close. It. Some somebody's badly parked, or at least they got to the office, right? They didn't have an accident. That's the good news. Indeed. So let us look at the uh, total equivalent warming impact as one of the uh, as the balance between energy efficiency and global warming potential. This is the definition that I took from the standard EN three seven eight. So it's a combined effect of the direct and indirect emissions, and the indirect emissions are the emissions from the power to, uh, that is needed to run the cooling machine. But there is a sentence below it, and it says, it is only valid for comparing alternative systems or refrigerant options for one application in one location. That's what the standard says. And I find that this discussion of total equivalent warming impact is being used too generally. This is a quote from the, a website from Atmosphere. I'll let you read it. So the International Institute of Refrigeration suggests here that somehow there might be a trade-off between reducing the global warming potential of refrigerants and the energy efficiency. This is just a variation that I hear in all sorts of ways. Yes, we not only should we look at the global warming potential of refrigerants, we should also look at the energy efficiency. I immediately contacted Michael Gary of Sheko at Atmosphere to say something is missing here because in my opinion, Natural refrigerants are the most efficient refrigerants anyway. So there is no trade-off. 
Okay, this is a graph that looks at the lifetime carbon emissions from a bioplanet store. This is a calculation we made in 2016. And I did not bother to recalculate it with the latest numbers. It shows on the vertical axis the emissions in carbon, in carbon CO2. On the left-hand side, our classical solution. And on the right-hand side, the propane solution. As you can see, we have a blue bar here that talks about the leakage. At the time, we calculated the leakage of 5%, which is very good. For, the for this year and for the last year, we are coming at 3.5% on average. That's very good. We also assumed a uh, recycling loss, you know, at the time when you somehow uh, 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 take away the old cooling installation, you might lose something. Our actual loss at the moment is 8% at that moment. At the, at the very top, you see a very small green line, which is the energy use. Why is that? If you look at the 2021 uh, data for Belgium, and you compare the carbon intensity of the, the, the electricity, electricity grid in Belgium, and you compare that with the electricity that Cora uses, there's a big difference. So the assumption that the energy efficiency is important in, in the sense of climate emissions, that's only relevant as long as you use dirty electricity. But as you know, we have the Paris Agreement, we have the EU Green Deal. Mark just mentioned the IPCC report. There's no way we can continue with dirty electricity. It's not happening. In fact, photovoltaic panels are already cheaper than oil in a lot of occasions. So it's happening anyway. And you cannot take the emission numbers for electricity from the past and then project that into the future. At the top, I listed a few different ways to look at the global warming potential. As you can see, if you look at the old assessment report, which is the basis of the EU FGAS regulation, R507 had a number of almost 4,000 and propane had a number of almost three. With the new assessment report, these numbers are, have gone, gone further apart. But also we need to look at the 20 year number because we need to solve this climate crisis in the next 10 to 20 years. We cannot wait 100 years. I always compare to my family, uh, what happens if we lose one kilogram of the old refrigerant? And that's just as bad as driving around the, the planet with an efficient car, with a small car. But even if we look at the greenhouse gas emissions, do we also need to look at production and uh, breakdown products because the, even in the very good IPCC report, the global warming potential numbers are single component numbers. They do not look into emissions during production. And they also forget that these products that come into our world will break down into secondary products. In fact, if you look into the new latest refrigerants, the HFOs, they are unstable in the uh, atmosphere. This is why they have a low global warming potential, but then they break down into something more stable. And I've added a resource here, and I would uh, recommend to read it because this is a very good summary of what I'm talking about. Further, if we look at the energy efficiency of the refrigerant, this is a table that I took from a Dutch article that compared the thermodynamics of refrigerants. And of course, this table is the result of calculations and assumptions that have been made. And of course, you need to read the entire article to, be, to get all the, 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 the total picture. But I'm using it to make the point that if you look at the coefficient of performance, the efficiency, it's almost the same for every refrigerant. I'm sorry to say that CO2 has a lower COP in this calculation, but we have seen in this conference many times that, of course, this can be improved if you add ejectors and parallel compression and so forth. You can also see that the evaporation energy, QE, is the highest for, for ammonia. So this is ammonia is really the best refrigerant whenever you can use it. But you can also see that uh, for propane, it's much larger than for the two chemical refrigerants that I've listed here. Or you can look at the uh, volumetric cooling ca capacity. So how much volume do I need to uh, compress in order to have my cooling process? And then you can see that the chemical refrigerants have a lower volumetric cooling capacity. It means that I need a larger compressor. So this impacts my investment costs. If I look at this picture, I really do not see why we would have a problem by using natural refrigerants in terms of energy efficiency and costs. I don't see it. Now, let us look at the other non-climate change environmental impacts. 
So CO2, and I, you know, as you know, I am biased towards natural refrigerants, but for this analysis, I've tried to be as neutral as possible. For CO2, we have the climate impact, but I cannot think of any other problem with CO2. Yes, maybe the pressure, but it's been handled. If we look at ammonia, I'm trying to make an estimate of the leaks from refrigeration plants in Belgium. There are no numbers on the number of plants or the emissions available, but my best estimate arrives at 0.2%, 0.02% of the total emissions in Belgium, the largest part being, of course, cattle. If we look at hydrocarbons, in theory, they cause smog, but hydrocarbons being so flammable, I'm sure people will make a great deal of effort to make sure that they, these refrigerants stay in the cooling machine, otherwise the cooling machine wouldn't work and it would be dangerous. And if we look at paint, if we look at our cars, petrol use, I'm convinced that there are many other sources of hydrocarbons in our uh, air not, and not, uh, that refrigerants are really not the main factor. But if we look at HFOs and HFCs, we did notice a few surprising points. Well, this is a graph that we've made based on the data that you and I, you can all find publicly. And this is the type of graph that we see frequently in brochures selling A to L refrigerants. What you see on the vertical axis is the lower flammability limit. And on the horizontal axis, you will see the flame speed. As you can see, the A to L chemical refrigerants appear at the top of the graph, ammonia very close to the red line at 0.1 kilogram per cubic meter. And of course, the hydrocarbons appear below that line. But the point is that this is based, the threshold here is based on an old threshold between category two and category three refrigerants. I didn't notice, but it was a young colleague of mine who just had joined our team who pointed out to me that this was a wrong graph. And then we thought, well, if they can manipulate graphs, so can we. So we've done that. We've taken the same data and then used the correct limit. Now you see suddenly that ammonia appears all the way at the top and the chemical refrigerants appear below that. Visually, this sends a totally different message. So this is the old one. This is how it's being sold. This is the correct way to do it, if you follow the standard. Now, why is that? Remember from uh, secondary school, the ideal gas law, pressure times volume equals number of moles times the gas constant times the temperature. So the volume percentage follows the moles. And since the, these chemical refrigerants are a lot heavier, having replaced hydrogen with fluor, they create more mass. This is why. This is why they appear higher on the, on the first graph. And given that we need to look, we are dealing with air, we need to look at the volume percentages, not the mass percentages. Then we went on and said, well, wait a minute, what happens if we would take the burning enthalpy of each refrigerant and multiply that with the concentration exactly at the lower flammability limit? And somebody had told me this in the past and it's actually true, propane has the lowest value. So what happens here is that R123 IF and so forth, they, you, you need to add more molecules into the air in order to reach the lower flammability limit. But once you do that, and once you do have an ignition, the energy being released is more than in the case of propane. And for me, for me, this graph is very helpful because in my role, having introduced propane as a refrigerant, I need to explain regularly to authorities or to my management that this is a safe choice. And this graph shows that the chemical refrigerants are not necessarily more safe. Now, let us look at the flame speed, the other part of the graph. <clears throat> How relevant is the flame speed? This is a report written by a laboratory in the United States, and it says the following. I'll let you read it. It literally says that the low burning velocity, velocity of A2L does not prevent flame speed or ignition. Why is that? This is the flame speed measurement in ISO 817. 
it's a 40 millimeter tube. And if I compare a 40 millimeter tube, this does not look like a refrigerated cabinet. Our shop does not look like a 40 millimeter tube. And more than 25 years ago, when I studied chemical engineering, I learned that if we were able to do a reaction in a laboratory tube, and we would then want to make build a multi-million dollar production plant, we were not able to do that. We had to go in different steps. We had to scale up. We had to look at the scaling effect. Because here we have a small volume of uh, refrigerant in air in a small pipe. And that just behaves differently compared to the same chemicals in a larger volume. It's known in the chemical engineering business. But here we have the situation that the test in a 40 millimeter tube is being used to argue that it is safe, that it is realistic, and it is not realistic. Well, the report goes on and it shows many different uh, conclusions. And it actually says that flammable concentrations can be reached fairly easily in confined spaces. And it also talks about other problems that they have seen, like a mist being formed or the effect of oil being present in the refrigerant, because the test we had here, it doesn't contain any oil. But in a cooling machine, I have oil, and that will add to the possibility of ignition. I've added the re reference of the report here. And actually, in the preface of this report, you will see that there is a committee following this research. And you will see all the known names in the business. So this is known. And I am not aware of new research that has uh, said otherwise. But if somebody has good research that shows me otherwise, I'm happy to learn about that. Now, these facts that I've just, or these, if, this information that I've just given you, I think is an explanation why in Germany in 2013 and 2014, practical tests actually showed the flammability of R123IF, which was then the replacement for air conditioning cars. So this is the practical test. And this actually shows in practice, it actually burns. It's dangerous in that sense. So that brings me to my last and concluding slide. <clears throat> so we've spoken about the single component effect of refrigerants, and actually we need to go towards a life cycle effect. We need to look at emissions during the refrigeration production. And we also need to look at emissions during the use of the refrigerant. And we need to look at secondary emissions due to environmental degradation. And there are actually two categories. One type of degradation is the one that goes basically to TFA and similar acids. These are permanent chemicals. They stay in our world forever. They accumulate in water. They accumulate at the poles at cold points because the whole earth is like a distillation column. It boils out the TFA where it's warm and it condenses it where it's cold. Once it is in our drinking waters, we can never get it out. And then there's another problem. And there's research that says that, suggests that r 4 ze is going to convert partially into R23, which is the worst ever HFC we've produced with a global warming potential of around 12,000 to 15,000, depending on the source you are using. And even only 10% then is a huge impact. And I know this is research. I know this has not been formally confirmed and so on, so on. But I will, would like to go back to the time probability. Our planet is a one spectator across time. We are doing experiments with our planet. What if in 20 years time, we conclude that it was really a bad idea to use HFOs? The waste that this has caused is not going to go away. In my personal opinion, I think we cannot take that chance. We cannot take that risk. So this is one spectator across time, and then we need to go for experiments that are safe to do. We need to do things that we can reverse. And if you want to read further, I recommend the briefing that uh, the European Citizens on Standards wrote, which gives a very good summary of what I've just said. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm open to hear your questions. Thank you, Colin, uh, for a great presentation. Um, we'll just wait for people to uh, submit some questions in the box. 
next to the live stream, bottom right, for those of you that are watching this right now. Uh, there's, a, there's a few second time lags, so I'll wait for those to pop up. There was a little, I guess this is a joke, <laughs> well, no, uh, from Louisa, one of our uh, uh, media partners, saying, Colin, no men in your end user perspective. Because she was, you know, when you were talking about the end user, it was just female after female, but there were no men. So that's just a, that's just a nope. point to, to note there. Maybe you want can to react. I, can to I that. answer that? Can I answer that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I had I, I used uh, photos from our media portal, yeah. and I will and I noticed as well that I was not able to find a man doing the shopping. Yeah. Not as good. Not as good a picture as this one. And I'm per I totally agree with you. Uh, actually, I do a lot of the shopping myself and the cooking at home. And uh, it's a very good remark, and I will definitely lead that back to our media people here, that we need some more men in that role. Uh, just likewise, we need, we need more women in the te technical role. We actually do have quite a few female engineers, by the way, so that's actually the case. But technicians, we don't. So, but I could have shown you a picture with a, com with a female technician, uh, engineer, if I wanted to. Okay. Thank you, Colin. Um, I think you've answered Louisa's question um, or uh, rep responded to her comment. Uh, Louisa, feel free to react if you still have a comment on that. Um, there's a question from Eric uh, Menke. Um, are, you, are there any negative impact from R290 being a hydrocarbon? Are there any, basically, what's, what are the negative impacts of R290? Because, you know, as an end user, You've looked at, you try to look at as objectively as possible all sorts of different refrigerants because you've got that expertise and because you know you've got the you've got to deliver a service to your customers and your management relies on your expertise to be able to look at which refrigerant is the best. And 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 when it comes to R290, what were you what were the negatives that you found? Okay, because propane is flammable, you cannot use it in, use it in very large quantities which means that for our cooling systems, we need to work indirectly, which means we need a cold glycol to pump that to our cooling uh, refrigerated cabinets. And then of course, the transfer of energy from the propane towards the, the, the secondary medium, we lose some efficiency, we have a delta T. And of course, and it also becomes more complicated in that sense, if you will do it like that. Um, that part, in that part, CO2 is more easy because CO2 can be pumped towards your supermarket. But then again, the, the, the cooling machine for CO2 is much more complicated than the cooling machine for propane because the propane cooling machine is practically identical to one which is HFC. Um, so the flammability is an issue, of course. Uh, in terms of the environment, I don't see any problems, but the flammability needs to be handled, that's clear. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got two minutes left for the, before the next session. So I, I have a question for you. Um, unless someone slips in another question in the meantime. Um, but you're basically saying that <laughs> these HFOs are actually pretty flammable. Yes. And the way they've been communicated uh, in the marketplace is to downplay that, uh, yeah. to misinform. Doesn't that concern you as an end user? That they're try that maybe there's a deliberate action here? It does, in fact. And I didn't mention that, but you need to consider that if you look at the amount of refrigerant that I'm allowed to use following all the standards, then this amount follows the lower flammability limit. So if the flow of lower flammability is higher, then I'm allowed to use more of an A2L than an A A3 refrigerant. And then or, and even the standards even go beyond that. I am one of the three people in Belgium actually actively voting the TC61 on standards because nobody actually votes, nobody's present. And that's a too small a number. And so this story is being told by people who have a, have a vested interest. Okay. Um, I got my colleagues telling me we've just got a few seconds left. So I'd like to... Um, Give a round of applause to Colin. Um, there was one good question coming, but unfortunately we've run out of time. Um, hopefully you'll be able to answer that directly within the chat in, in swap card, okay? Um, but yes, thank you, Colin, for taking the time.
You're welcome. I wish we'd been able to have you uh, do this in person, but hopefully next year. In the meantime, obviously, we'll see you later on the end user panel. So thank you okay. again, Colin, and see You're you welcome. later. Thank you, everyone. We're now going to log off. And next, uh, my colleague Alana will take over to welcome um, our uh, technology uh, 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 technology.